Good morning. Welcome everybody to Cowboy Church. We're glad you're here. We got about a minute for you to get you some coffee and donuts and stuff back there. The bread ministry's got full table over here, Arizona Bread Ministry. And all that bread and stuff's right next to the red can that we put truck parts and diesel fuel in. The, the old truck's kind of like me, it's high mileage. It takes a lot to keep it going. It's always good if you find something to put in that can over there. There's lots of bread and stuff over there. I saw, I saw beagles and, and flatbread and all kinds of stuff like that over there. T-shirts, where, where's my cue cards? Where, where is my cue? Where? <laughs> Wake up. Now they all went up at one time. Look at all that, okay. <clears throat> we've got t-shirts back there. I probably don't have a cue card for the t-shirts. We, we've only got four t-shirts left. If you, if you want a I Believe t-shirt, Believe t-shirt, yeah. You got any, you got, you got any more of the uh, normal isn't coming back? Yeah, that one went fast, didn't it? Yeah, we can order and we got, we're putting in another order for more shirts. Maybe it's getting time to order sweatshirts, I don't know. Got some coming too, okay. So we got some coming. Long sleeve, long sleeve. Why do they call them t-shirts? Anybody know? Look like a T. Undershirts, yeah, I don't know what it's called, undershirts. I never had a t-shirt till after I was married. There's always undershirts for them. We've got announcements this morning. Very, very important announcements. They're in the bulletin. Read the bulletin. We, we got a few extra here. A few extra announcements. We, we're going to need some help after the service is putting the chairs up. We're going to put them all to the front here for the for Betty Barn sale next week. Ooh. And we're going to have to get some help to unload. We've got two trailer loads full of stuff for us today and full of stuff that's going to come in. Right after, right after Cowboy Church. Put the chairs up and unload the trailers for Betty's Bargain Barn Sale. And Miss Betty's got something to say, and if you're not quiet, you won't hear a word she says. Just a suggestion. Uh, is anybody listening? All right. We had a real good sale last time. We did really great. So if you've got anything laying around that you don't want, you don't need, just bring it in or somebody can use it. And everything is real cheap, so come on. Mm -hmm. It starts Thursday, Friday, at noon on Saturday. But we are accepting donations Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. I'll be here at 8 o'clock until people don't come anymore and I'm going to go home. <laughs> <laughs> Bye. Thank you. All right. One man's junk is another man's treasure, so. Mm. My, my wife says I've got a lot of junk, but she just don't understand it's inventory. <laughs> what it is. It's inventory. You never know when you might need it. But, well, I need, I need to get some of it itemized. If you've, got, if you've got these things, what do you call them, cell phones, put them on Mute or, or Airplane or something like that. So we won't have to embarrass you during church if yours goes off. Because uh, Steve will point it out. You bet him, brother. See? <laughs> All right. That's the phones. Um, White House. You see, Miss Betty is trying to put our White House out of business. That's why she's having these bargain barn sales. And, and, and she's bound to determine to get the bathrooms finished here. So... Um, Help out with the barn sale, and she, she's got her done. Miss Betty. All right. Thank you, Miss Betty, and everybody that helps her. We don't pass the hat at Cowboy Church. We've got birdhouses right back there. We don't pass the hat. We've got birdhouses right back there at the end of the aisle. Uh, the only thing you should put in there is what God tells you to, and I dare you to ask him. For visitors and first-timers here, our White House is right outside that east door over there and to your right. It is a two-holer. Ours is much more efficient than the White House in Washington, D.C. because ours actually flushes. And uh, hopefully they'll get that one fixed in there. So ours works. Cue cards. I want to thank everybody Tuesday for coming in and helping. We had one and a couple injuries. So, Uh-oh. But one guy shot a nail through his thumb. But uh -oh. Ow! He, he's all right. <sighs> It was a long ways from his heart, thank the Lord. Uh, uh, what was he aiming at? 
He went right through the stud, and right? right oh, right. He had his hand on the other side. Okay. Yeah, he split the stud. You got to be careful with that. Yeah. yeah. He should have had a hard thumb on. Is there any more cue cards out there? I've watched yeah. that and say, it's way too far for me to see it. Dual orders. Are we ready for the dual orders? We've got to pray first. Well, yeah, we can. Okay, we're getting close. Anything else? Yeah, not so hard, Roger. I fixed it again. <laughs> You, you just barely <laughs> I want all of our visitors and, and new folks here to feel comfortable and welcome here. We do have membership class coming up, and um, I mentioned it here a while back and forget when it is. We'll keep looking in the bulletin. And uh, we've got a list back there if somebody wants to be baptized. Get your name on the list, and I'd advise you to get her done for the ice farms on the uh, on the uh, River Jordan horse tank. Um, get it together, yeah. Next Sunday, all you team leaders have your budgets all put together and everything for our leadership team meeting, which will be right after Cowboy Church over in the trailer. Well, you ain't been here, slacker. Bible study will start soon. <laughs> when did I? This Wednesday? The second. I said that? Yeah. <laughs> okay. That's this Wednesday? That's like two or three days from now? You get out of a lot of things with that loss of memory, huh? Mm. <laughs> All right. We'll have Pastor Round Pen over in the trailer Wednesday. I'm going to be coming down every day this week. It's about. You'll be catching up well, with me, right? But you weren't here. It's your fault. So, you'll be, you'll be mm -hmm. catching up with me. Yeah. <laughs> Bible, Bible study, Wednesday, 5.30 over in the trailer. We'll have something to chew on from 5.30 to 6. And then from 6 to 7, we have Bible study, and we will promptly leave. Something. No, I'll take care of it. You're going to get pizza or sandwiches. Be pizza or sandwiches, one or the other. Yeah. Something like that. Take a bath this month? <laughs> well, you know, out there in water hall, you don't waste water. You don't do it all the time. Yes, Fred. <laughs> and Kathy, too. Yeah, I understand. Um, there's bound to be something else and other things that I should say that would be too numerous to mention. So I won't. What else? Let's pray. Let's pray. Oh Lord, it's, it's, we've had a tough couple of weeks. Nan and I, we, we, we were beat up and beat down and sick. And and uh, I woke up this morning and I was, okay, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you, Lord, for this day. And uh, for each one that's here, Father, we just pray that our visitors and new folks coming, Father, feel welcome here, Father. Lord, help us to learn how to get along with you, Father and how to teach the world around us to get along with you. Father, help us to, have an ex to, to, to be an example to a world around us, Father, that serving you is the right thing to do and the right way to go. Father, bless your word this morning. Bless the music. Bless the worship. The praise, Father. And Father, we pray for those that are sick and struggling and uh, set the ones in, in bondage free, Father. And Lord, just help us have a hunger for your word and a closer walk with you. Father, we ask that you be with those that are traveling on the road today. They bring back, you bring them back safely to us, Father. Bless us, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Church says. Amen. Cowboy Church says. Do Lorders. Do Lorders. We got Do Lorders this morning. Well, I guess you guys have to sit in. That, that slim thing's down. Do Lorders. You got no mic? Hello. I, I'm loud. We need a mic. Is there anybody here named Mike? Is it? Okay.
This morning we're going to do a little something different. Gordy's got a story he's going to tell everybody, so here he comes up the middle aisle. Hi, how are you? How are you doing? Roger. Yeah. Roger, is that you? Mostly. My old friend, Roger. Yeah, get the mic. Roger, Roger and me, we go back a long, long way. We was kids all the way back from when we was little kids. We were friends. In fact, Roger and me, we were we were scouts together in the very first scout troop ever. With the very first scout master ever. Do you remember him, Roger? Roger. No, we were the Roger. Mr. Uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Moses. That was Moses. Mr. Moses. Oh, yeah. Remember yeah. him? Yeah. yeah. We're contemporaries. Yeah, yeah. But do you remember that long time trek we went on, that hike? It wasn't my fault. Oh. oh, this is a great story. Do you mind if I tell it? Okay. Uh, oh, good. I'm going to tell it anyway. <laughs> you see, Mr. Mr. Moses was going to take us on this long-term trek. It's a backpacking trip. It was going to take us maybe, maybe a week or so. We started going. Mr. Moses is leading the troop. We're doing great the first day. It sounds like COVID. <laughs> Are you going to keep on interrupting me? If I, if I have to. <laughs> so, the first day worked pretty good. Except for when we got to the river, we must have took the wrong trail when there was that split. Because when we got to the river, well, the bridge wasn't there to get us over to the other side. And we got to the part of the river where it was really deep and really wide and the water was moving really fast. Mr. Moses was over there walking back and forth by the, by the shoreline wondering what to do. But Roger here, Roger ran, ran up to him and said, Mr. Moses, Mr. Moses, the twelfth point of the scout law is that a scout is reverent. Why don't you talk to God and ask him what to do? And Mr. Moses says, you're right, kid. I'm going to do that. And he did it. He talked to God, and God told him exactly what to do. And he did that. He put the end of his walking staff in the edge of the water, and poof, the water split. It stopped flowing and it split, and there was a wall of water on this side, and a wall of water on that side. And it means in between, there was, it was dry land. It was a miracle. It was amazing. And Mr. Moses, he led the whole troop across to the other side of the river. And then as soon as we got everybody over there, poof, it closed up on it, and the water started flowing again. And we were just so glad. It was just amazing. And Mr. Moses called Roger over, and he said, Come here, kid. He said, You know, you really saved my bacon back then. <laughs> oh, oh no, I'm not supposed to say bacon. <laughs> we're not supposed to eat bacon. <laughs> but I really like it. But don't tell nobody. So he said, Look, kid. You seem really smart. You're a really smart scout. So maybe if, if I give you this map, can you figure out where we are and which is the best way to get to the Camp Promised Land? Because we have to hike to the Camp Promised Land. And Roger says, sure, I can do it. I took orienteering. So he got the map and he laid it out on a big flat rock. And he got his trusty little compass out. And he oriented the map. And he worked on it for quite a while. And then he said, I've got it. I know which way to go. And Mr. Moses says, all right, everybody. Roger knows how, where to go. Let's follow him. So we did. And we were walking. And we were hiking. And we were hiking. And we were walking. We were doing great for days on end. Just kept on going and going. And it took a while before somebody figured out something might be wrong here. Because 
we were wandering around in the wilderness for a little while, about 40 years. <laughs> well, Roger, when he oriented the map, he had the map upside down. <laughs> so by that time, Mr. Moses was getting kind of old. He felt like he couldn't go on. And he thought maybe he should retire. And so he left us. Some of us thought that maybe he went to wait for, maybe went to work for BSA National. A few of us thought he went to work for Hebrew National. But anyway, he was gone, and he left his assistant, scoutmaster, in charge. That was Mr. Joshua. Mr. Joshua led us right up to the Camp Promised Land. Didn't take too long, but since we were arriving a little bit late, well, he thought maybe we should have kind of a grand entrance. So, he says, look, troop, this is what I want to do. When we get into the Camp Promised Land, we got to give the, the troop yell. But we need a signal. So everybody yells at the same time. So he says, I know. How about if we have the camp, the, the troop bugler, blow his horn, and that'll be the signal for us to give the troop yell. <clears throat> and he says, okay, who's the camp bugler? Well, that was Roger. <laughs> and this is a lesson to all of you. If you want to play a musical instrument well, it takes practice, practice, practice. Am I right? Yeah. Right. I don't know, I don't practice that much. Roger, I don't think Roger practiced very much. <laughs> he, when he blew his bugle, it was a little different. In fact, we kind of called him a new note finder. <laughs> so, anyway. I play a sax. Well, you played a bugle back then. Because that's all we had in Boy Scouts. That's the problem. Yeah. Anyway, so, we started walking into the, the entrance to the Camp Promised Land. And it's a big, beautiful gate. And right over here, there was the, the council headquarters in this big, beautiful building. I think they called it the Jericho Building. So, we're walking in there, and, and he knows what's coming here. <laughs> so, so, we're walking in there, and we get, get you know, right, right into the entrance there. And then Mr. Joshua says, all right, Roger, all right, kid, blow your bugle. Come on, blow, blow that horn. Play your heart out. Blow your horn. And Roger blew. Oh, boy, did he ever blow. <laughs> well, everybody started yelling. But it wasn't really the troop yell. It was more like a agony. It was painful. <laughs> It hurt. <laughs> and then the funniest thing happened. The Jericho building, it started falling apart. I don't understand it. It started crumbling and all these people are running out of the building. They're screaming and yelling and running for their lives. Oh my gosh, it was horrible. And then after the dust settled, everybody was gathered around in a big circle. And in the middle of the circle was Scout Roger. He never seen so many people mad at one little scout. Oh, that was so much fun, wasn't it? Oh, boy. We had a day, didn't we? Well, I really appreciate you, Roger, and our long friendship. God bless you. All right. That's a whole lot better than some stuff he could have told on my way. <laughs> Thank you, Gordon. We still on here. <laughs> because it's Pastor Appreciation Month, on behalf, on behalf of the band, I ordered this shirt for Roger. Oh. 
I'm willing to bet the band about ten dollars that he'll never wear it. <laughs> Any, anyway, I'm going to give it to him because it reminded me of him so much <laughs> when I saw it. And I feel like somebody took his likeness and put this on a shirt, and he's not going to get any money for it. So, because of that, I went ahead and bought him one. Thank you. Thank you. No, that's you. I like it. You know, I uh, I heard the sheep herders was coming through town, so I got them cornered and, and I got rid of all this, mainly because this time of year. I have trouble at Walmart with little kids grabbing hold of my legs, so I don't want this, I don't want that. You know? So, I, I got... You understand the problem. Thank you, guys. Thank you, thank you. And uh, I just wonder where they got that picture of me. Y'all watch my Facebook page, because you see a bunch of Santa Claus stuff going on. George. George.
this morning. You know? Now Dewey, when he's out there, he's pretty. But there ain't no comparison. Thank you girls and mama for getting them up here. That's, that takes work. I got little Wranglers heading out this morning. Wranglers, where's Miss Kathy? There she is. Limping on over there. Huh? Little Wranglers, head them up out the west door. Let's go. When um, I started off about 5 o'clock this morning, okay, God, I got to go to work this morning. What are we going to talk about? What are we going to talk about? Nothing. And nothing. And nothing. And so I kept asking, I kept, what are we going to talk about? Then I heard, your little toe. My little toe? Your little toe. Have you ever looked at your little toe? You ever look at somebody else's? Ain't they the funniest looking things you ever seen? I mean, what do we got those little toes for that you can't do nothing with them? They're always in the way out there when you try to get around the bed or the chest or something to get to the little room with the handy furniture. You always hit it. It's always that one. I love you, Gordy. But what do we got that little toe for? I, I, I never, I don't know. Mine's an aggravation. It's getting, I know I'm getting taller as so I'm getting older because my feet keep getting farther away. <laughs> so I'm, I must be growing. You know, Jesus is always in full control. Always. He's always in full control. I've heard people say, well, I don't know. The devil's doing this and the devil's doing that. Listen, that devil's on a short lead. The devil can't do nothing unless God lets him do it. And, and God put everything under Jesus' control to take care of things. Jesus is always in full control. In uh, Mark chapter 14, and we're, we're going to go back and we're going to do a little time travel here back through um, um, Passover, about 32, 33 B.C. or A.D. in there, um, the time when Jesus was crucified pay for my sins going back to there and this couple days before that mark mark 14 it was now two days before passover and the festival of unleavened bread and the leading priest and the teachers of religious law were still looking for an opportunity to capture jesus secretly and kill him they tried they would have been trying to kill him from way back when always um you remember when the uh, Magi came and talked to Herod and said, we, we see the signs in, in the heavens that the king is born. Herod says, is that right? He says, I'm king. I ain't got room for no other kings. We're just, we're, where's he supposed to be? Well, they say he's supposed to be down in Bethlehem. 
Well, I just go down there and kill all the kids, and that's what he did. Jesus wasn't there. God told his daddy, he says, you take him on down to Egypt for a while. Get out of here. And he did that. God is in control. The devil tried to kill Jesus. He'd been trying to kill mankind off from the beginning. But they was trying, they was looking for opportunity to, to kill him and to take him secretly. But not during the Passover celebration. They didn't want to do it during, the devil didn't want to kill him during Passover, during the holidays, the, the high feast. I wonder why. They said because people might riot. And we go on down there and we find out that all Jesus' hands didn't have clean hearts and clean hands. Down in verse 10 it says, Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve, he went to the leading priest to arrange to betray Jesus to him. I don't know what Judas' beef was. I, I don't know. I don't know. <coughs> he saw all the miracles. He'd known the scriptures. He, he knew. He just had to know that Jesus up to this point had fulfilled every prophecy in the Old Testament of being the Messiah. I mean, he saw him raise the dead. He was there. And saw him when, he said, Lazarus, you come out of that tomb, Lazarus, four days stinking in the grave. He saw the miracles. Saw him heal the blind. Saw the lame walk. Saw him feed 5,000 with a Long John Silver sack lunch. He saw the miracles. I don't know why he didn't believe. I've got friends and maybe family don't believe. I don't know why. Fred and I have talked about it many, many times about the why it's privilege it's a privilege to know god if god's put it in your heart to know him boy you consider that a privilege and be so thankful because most of the world out there don't and they don't want to and they don't care you know they don't i don't know why i've never had any trouble believing i um, from Gen 1 to the end of Rev 22, there's not one word in there that I, I have any trouble believing. I've always believed it. But I, I had a drug problem, you know, growing up. I was drugged to church every time the doors was open. And uh, I had 400 gold stars from memory verses. I mean, I, I knew God's Word, and I never ever had any trouble believing any of it. Um, I saw a cartoon one time where Moses and, and Elijah was sitting on a creek bank fishing. And Elijah looks over and says, Quit that, Moses! Because the water was over here where Moses was and over here, but where Elijah was, there was no water. <laughs> and so Elijah couldn't catch any fish. He said, You quit that, Moses! I don't know why people... You know, when... when um, I don't remember, it was after we was married, Danny says, don't try to give me the notes for that first sermon I wrote when I was six. No idea. And he says, kept it all those years. It was in this Bible when I was ordained. And uh, I wrote notes down, and which would be for a sermon for joy is a fruit. It's a fruit of the indwelling spirit. It's a fruit of being in fellowship with God. All those years I went to went to church and I was a mess. I was a terrible kid. Um, Gordy can testify to that. He does testify to it anyway. And I never played the trumpet. I played saxophone. And the piano and the flute and the clarinet and the guitar and about anything else there was. But I never played the trumpet. That explains <laughs> I, I um, at a very early age, I was asking God, forgive me my sins. I knew I was a sinner, little. I mean, I, I knew. And when I was 14, I went down in front of Mount Pleasant Baptist Church in Medora, Illinois, and I went down there, and, and I said, I want to make public that I trust Jesus to be my Savior. I trust Him. Because I thought that would get guilt and shame off my back. And the next Sunday they baptized me. And I thought, now I'll be a little Jesus. I won't be telling the dirty jokes and thinking the bad things and lying, stealing, cheating, doing all those things. 
I was a junior high kid and I was still doing those things. And, and I didn't understand why. I didn't understand why when I'd done everything that the church had told me to do. Learn Bible verses. Pray. Get baptized. Make a profession of faith. And still I was an honorary little sucker. And I was ashamed. I hated it. And I felt guilty. And when you're like that, you can feel lost. I didn't know the difference between relationship and fellowship. And nobody in church was teaching us. In most churches, they still don't, don't teach you. In cowboy church, our mission is to teach you how to get along with God. And in order to get along with God, you must establish the relationship. Third time back through college, I went back to finish up psychology. And one of the, there's always talking about relationships, relationships, relationships in, in, the, in sociology or psychology courses and stuff like that. And, and I said, you know, I look at things from a spiritual point of view, and I think that there's more to it than relationship because relationships basically biological. I said, what you're talking about is fellowship, getting along with each other. There's a difference. Relationship is DNA. God gave us moms and daddies so we'd learn how to get along with God. He could have made us apricots or peaches or something like that and just come off a tree and there'd be a Fred banana or or a Gordy peanut. <laughs> but God gave us moms and dads to show us what a relationship was. They're our relatives. They're our kinfolk. We got their DNA. And you know what? No matter how honorary you are and how much mom and daddy might want to duck their head, they can't take your DNA back. They're your mom and dad. Jesus told Nicodemus, he says, you must be born again. Nicodemus, well, how am I going to do that? I'm going to enter my mama's womb again and get born again. And Jesus says, no, that ain't, that ain't it. He says, what is spirit, spirit, and what's flesh is flesh. And you must be born again. Born of the spirit. Well, I've gone to different preachers' meetings and stuff. I come up with a, with a question that makes them scratch their head. I said, where's Jesus? What's Jesus' daddy's DNA? He's got 23 chromosomes from Mary. Had enough biology to know he got 23 chromosomes from Daddy because he's all man and he's all God. Where does those 23 chromosomes come from? And then the Bible tells us that she conceived of the Holy Spirit. She's conceived of the Holy Spirit. So God Himself put His DNA in His Son Jesus. And when we come to God the Father... And say, I'm a sinner. I need saved. I want to be saved and I believe your plan. Which is, your son died and paid for my sins. And I accept that. And God the Father puts his DNA in you to seal you forever. Just like your mom and daddy don't take your DNA back. God the Father does not take his DNA back if you don't mind. You've established the relationship by belief. Saved by belief. By believing. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now shall be saved. Doesn't say beat five tambourines. Jump over ten pews. And blow a bugle. You know. It says believe. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And now shall be saved. Believe what? Believe he died for my sins. And accept that pardon that he has for us. I don't know why Judas didn't do that. I don't know why. Judas, one of the twelve disciples, went to the leading priest to arrange to betray Jesus to them. They were delighted when they heard why he'd come. And they promised to give him money. So Judas began looking for a way to betray Jesus. Now in Matthew, we get a little different view of what's going on. Meanwhile, Jesus was in Bethany at the home of Simon, a man he had previously had leprosy. Jesus cleansed him. While he was eating, a woman came in with an alabaster jar of expensive perfume and poured it on his head. The disciples were indignant when they saw this. They said, what a waste. They didn't understand why Jesus was letting this woman come in and 
anoint him with what funeral directors used to preserve the bodies of the dead. That's what was in that. Could have been sold for a high price, the money given to the poor. But Jesus, knowing what they were thinking, and says, why you criticize this woman for doing such a good thing to me? You'll always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. She poured his, this perfume on me to prepare my body for burial. What an outstanding statement to make. Well, they were there eating in this guy's house. And just Jesus says, she put it on me to bury me. And then Judas, one of the twelve disciples, he went to the leading priests. He says, I, and he asks, says, how much do you pay me to betray Jesus? And they gave him 30 pieces of silver. And from that time on, Judas began looking for an opportunity to betray Jesus. Now, they were all gathered up there in Jerusalem for the Passover feasts, spring feasts. On the first day of the festival of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus and says, where, where do you want us to prepare a Passover a meal for you? And you remember the chief priest and everything says, we want to catch him, we want to kill him, but we don't want it to happen during Passover or any of these things that make people upset. But you know who's in control? Jesus is in control. He says, you go into the city, he told them, and you see a man, and you tell him, teacher says, my time has come and I will eat the Passover meal with my disciples at your house. So the disciples did as Jesus told them and prepared the Passover meal there. When it was evening, Jesus sat down at the table with the twelve disciples. Before the Passover celebration, now we're getting over into John chapter 13. Before the Passover celebration, Jesus knew that his hour had come to leave this world and to return to his Father. He'd loved his disciples during his ministry on earth. Judas was one of them. And now he loved them to the very end. It was time for supper, and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon, Iscariot, to betray him. He'd already made the deal. Jesus knew that the Father had given him authority over everything that had come from God and would return to God. Jesus has authority over everything, over the devil, over all the demons, over all the bad stuff and over all the good stuff. Jesus has authority and power over it. John 13, 4. So he got up from the table and took off his robe, wrapped a towel around his waist, and he poured water in a basin. And then he began to wash the disciples' feet. That's what the job of a slave was. It's a slave's job, servant's job. When people come into the house, you know, the um, Jerusalem didn't have sidewalks and sewers and stuff back in those days. Uh, threw all the garbage out in the road and maybe everything else. They just wore flip-flops. And so when they come into somebody's house, they need their feet washed. Slave. Servant. But Jesus began to wash the disciples' feet. Now you can imagine that the disciples had hung out with Jesus three and a half years, three years, three and a half years. They'd hung out with him. They'd seen all the miracles he'd done. They watched him calm storms. You think demons stir up storms? I think demon blew one through our place here just the other day. Wish I could do that peace be still stuff sometimes. Jesus could. Because the demons knew he had authority over them. Where storms come from? Jesus can send storms. God can send storms. But demons can stir them up too. He does in our lives, doesn't he? He began to wash the disciples' feet, drying them with the towel he had around him. And when Jesus came to Simon Peter, Peter said, Lord, you ain't washing my feet. Kind of uppity righteousness thing. And, you know, I'm just going to tell you, you that you, you're, you're too good to be washing my feet, you know. Jesus says, you don't understand now what I'm doing, but someday you will. Peter hadn't been to Cowboy Church. He hadn't learned how to get along with God yet. Peter protested, says, you'll never, ever 
wash my feet. Jesus said, unless I wash you, you won't belong to me. Well, what is that washing? That washing is when we come to our Father, which we established the relationship with, and we've been disobedient, we've been sinning, we've been rebelling against God, and we come to Him and we say, Father, I was wrong. I'm sorry. Wash me, Father. Cleanse me. David says, Search my heart, O God. See if there be any wicked way in me. When we come to our Father by spiritual DNA and say, I was wrong, the Father reestablishes that relationship, not the relationship, the fellowship that we broke by our disobedience. You can't break the relationship, but you can break the fellowship. Jesus said, unless I wash you, you won't belong to me. Unless you accept my cleansing, unless you fess up, you won't be clean. Well, why is that important? Because God created everything like the ranks of the army. God's commander-in-chief. He gave all that power and authority to Jesus the Son. But then there's all kinds of powers and principalities and wickedness in high places and sin. And I call sin the drill sergeant. And it comes on down to the very bottom as a raw recruit is man in the flesh. We have no power or authority over these other spiritual aspects of God's creation. We have no power and authority. In the flesh, we're at the bottom of the pole. When we're in fellowship with our Father, we have the power and authority of the Holy Spirit of God over sin. I was so frustrated in my life at age 14 because I thought making that profession of faith and being baptized, I'd be a little Jesus. I was 30 years old when I learned how to get along with God. I was drunk 14 years. Unless I wash you, you won't belong to me. I felt lost many, many days. I couldn't understand what was wrong with my life. Because I believed everything in that book and I believed and I trusted God to take care of things. I, I knew if I died, I'd go to heaven. And I'd been so close to that dying so many times. I wrote in the back of this book when I was ordained. Prayed up, fessed up, well fed. That's how you get along with God. Prayed up. God, what do you want me to do today? Started off in the morning. Put on the whole armor of God before you go to war. Don't do any good. Put it on before you lay down at night. Put it on in the morning when you get out on the battlefield. God, what do you want me to do today? Read God's Word every day. Put on the armor. And when you mess up, you fess up. So you stay in fellowship with Him. So you have His... Paul calls it walking in the Spirit. That's what walking in the Spirit is. It's walking, prayed up, fessed up, well fed. <coughs> Peter explained, then wash my hands and head as well, Lord, not just my feet. Jesus said, a person that's been bathed all over doesn't need to wash except for his feet. We call it just being saved, don't we? When you're saved, you're saved. You're saved once because you're born again. God puts his spiritual DNA in you. If there was some way we could have a celestial microscope and they looked at your DNA, I think it would be a triple helix, mama. Daddy and the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Jesus said, A person who has bathed all over does not need to wash. A person that's saved doesn't need to be saved again. But we need to wash your feet for walking in the world, for being disobedient, for not obeying, for rebelling, rebellion. But not all of you. For Jesus knew who would betray him. And that's what he meant when he said, Not all of you are clean. After washing their feet, he put on his robe again and he sat down and he asked, Do you understand what I was doing? You call me teacher and Lord, and you're right because that's what I am. And since I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you ought to wash each other's feet. Love and forgive. None of us are little Jesus. None of us are any better than anybody else. We're just sinners, but by the grace of God. 
I've given you an example to follow. Do as I have done to you. I tell you the truth. Slaves are not greater than their master, nor is the messenger more important than the one who sends the message. Now that you know these things, God will bless you for doing them. I'm not saying these things to all of you. I know the ones I have chosen. But this fulfills the scriptures that says, The one who eats my food is turned against me. I tell you this beforehand so that when it happens, you will believe that I am the Messiah. Because the prophecy that these disciples had not yet seen was Jesus being killed and risen from the dead. They hadn't seen that yet. They're going to see it in a few days. He says, I'm telling you this beforehand so that when it happens, you'll believe that I am the Messiah. He says, I tell you the truth, anyone who welcomes my messenger is welcoming me. And anyone who welcomes me is welcoming the Father who sent me. Jesus was deeply troubled. He says, I tell you the truth, one of you will betray me. He loved Judas. He loved Judas. He loves you. The disciples look at each other wondering what, what he could mean. And the disciple Jesus loved was sitting next to him at the table. And Peter mentioned to him, he says, hey, hey, what's he talking about? Who's he talking about? And so it, we think it was probably John leaned over Jesus and says, who is it, Lord? And Jesus said, it's the one whom I give the bread I dip in the bowl. And when he dipped it, he gave it to Judas son of Simon Iscariot. And when Judas had eaten the bread, Satan entered into him. He's a little short of DNA, wasn't he? Then Jesus told him, you hurry and do what you're going to do. Who's in control? The timing. You know, everything that happened to Jesus, death, burial, resurrection, was right to the second on the clock of what was going on in the feasts in the temple on these days. Who's in control? None of the others at the table knew what Jesus meant, and Judas was their treasurer, so he thought Jesus was telling him to go buy and pay for the food or give some money to the poor. So Judas left at once, going out into the night, in the darkness. That's what it is, living without Christ's salvation. It's darkness. It's like that when you're out of fellowship too, isn't it? It is. It's important to be prayed up, fessed up, well fed. We go to John thirteen thirty one. As soon as Jesus left the room, Jesus says, Time has come for the Son of Man to enter in His glory, and God will be glorified because of Him. And since God receives glory because of the Son, He will soon give glory to the Son. He says, Children, He says, I'll be with you only a little while longer. And as I told the Jewish leaders, you'll search for me, but you can't come where I'm going. Disciples scratching their head. They expected Jesus to overthrow the government and take over and we'd have heaven on earth. They was expecting that. That's what they expected the Messiah to do. Oh, he's going to do it. <laughs> Just not on the disciples' time clock. On God's time clock. In his time. Jesus says, so now I'm giving you a new commandment. Love each other. Jesus, just as I have loved you, you should love one another. You know, it's one of the things that in many of the churches that the general population, they recognized the love that the brethren had for each other. I see that here. I see that here in this church. I see that here in this cowboy church. And I've been in lots of churches in 50 years. I've never felt so much love from the peoples I've felt in this church. You guys. <laughs> Jesus says your love for one another will prove to the world that you're his disciples. Psalms 34, 8. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusteth in him. Prayed up, fessed up. Well fed. Get your feet washed. Right down to the little toe. Right down to the little toe. Get it all clean. Get it all out there. Every bit of it. Even the ugly parts don't seem to mount too much. Get them out there. 
Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusteth in Him. Revelation 22, And the Spirit and the Bride say, Come. Let him that heareth say, Come. Let him that is thirst come. And whosoever will, let him take of the water of life freely. Romans 8 says, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit, prayed up, fessed up, well fed. Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world, and he that follows me shall not walk in darkness. Judas walked out in the darkness, he walked out into the night. He that follows me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. God gave us good news in this New Testament. It's all through the Old Testament too. Man wanted to know, what must I do to be saved? And they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Romans 10.9 says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God's raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Prayed up, fessed up, well fed. What happens when we mess up? First John chapter 2. My little children, these things I write unto you that you sin not. It's best to read the book and know how you're supposed to act and then do it. If any man sins, we have an advocate. We've got a lawyer. With the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and He is the propitiation for our sins. He's the payment. He's the covering. He made the deal for us, and He paid it. And not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Do you know that every seed of Adam that's ever walked on the face of this earth, their sins have been forgiven. He's paid for the sins of the whole world. They're forgiven. Then how come everybody ain't saved? You gotta pick up the pardon. You gotta believe. You gotta believe. He died for you. You gotta believe it. Second Chronicles seven fourteen says, If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven, will forgive their sin, and I'll heal their land. Well, we've got a sick land and needs healing, folks. What's our part? Prayed up, fessed up, well fed. That's our part. God, what do you want me to do today? Go do it. When you mess up, you fess up. You read the instruction book where the guarantee is written out. The last Sunday in the month. We always have the Lord's Supper. Jesus, we just read everything about what was going on at the Lord's Supper the last time. Paul wrote in Corinthians, he says, I've received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he given thanks, he broke it, and he said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. And after the same manner also, he took the cup, and when he'd supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. The Old Testament is... You break the law, you're lost. But he made provision by the sacrifice, blood sacrifice for animals, temporary covering, till God himself come and made the payment. Jesus, his blood, paid the bill. He said, this cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you show the Lord's death till he comes. Then there's a warning. For whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. How do you drink it unworthily? Either you're not saved, you haven't made the deal, you haven't taken the problem, the, the, the parole, the pardon, you're either not his child or also your little toes dirty. You haven't got fessed up. You're not in fellowship with your father. You don't drink of that cup or take of that bread until you've had time quiet with God the Father, getting clean hands and clean heart and a clean little toe. Unworthily shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord, but let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself. You're not saved. Not discerning the Lord's body. 
And for this cause, many are weak, and he's talking to church members. Sin just runs over you if you're out of fellowship. And sick and injured and dying is a result of sins. It is. Man would never have been sick if it hadn't been for sin. We were created to be eternal. Created to live forever. My knees haven't figured that out yet. This cause, many are weak and sick among you, and many sleep. There's sin unto death for God's children in the church. There's a man in the church of Corinth that was running his stepmama. Paul says, kick him out. Put him out. Why? For the devil to whoop up on him. He said, for the destruction of his flesh, though his soul. So we say that man was saved. He just wouldn't mind God. He thumbed his nose at God. Wouldn't be obedient. Wouldn't pay attention. He knew better. He didn't care. He's walking in the flesh. Many sleep. There's a sin unto death. If we judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we're chastened of the Lord that we should not be condemned of the Lord. It's far better to fess up than have God beat some sense in your head. It's far better. We're going to have the hand out the Lord's Supper. Sam, Fred, Bob, who else coming? Okay, got one coming over here. Pass these out to everybody. Well, anybody's welcome to take it. Baptized believers take the Lord's Supper. My advice is to be prayed up. Fessed up and well fed. Can you take it? Give me one before you get away. See, even that dog's fessing up back there. Just in time, Miss Kathy. Bible study Wednesday night. Pastor's round pen. That ought to be exciting. Don't forget to help gather up these chairs and push them up here. Somebody will be up here to organize how to stack them so we get it done right instead of just look like a New York City traffic wreck. <laughs> Everybody get served, one served. We good? I need one. Well, it's your husband's fault. <laughs> Kathy didn't. Kathy didn't get one. Oh, Fred's got. See, Fred's taking care of it. He's got it. Yeah. Okay. If anybody didn't survive cowboy church today, you didn't survive. We're glad you're here. Hope you feel at home. Hope you feel comfortable. We've got one goal, and that's to learn how to get along with God, and then to teach the people we love and run into how to get along with God. And the days are short, folks. The days are short. Let's get her done. Dear Heavenly Father, I just thank You, Lord, for the blessings this day for each one that's here, Father. Bless each one that's here, Father. Bless them in their spiritual walk. Bless them in their goals and their endeavors, Father. Bring healing to those that are sick. Father, bring comfort to those that are mourning. Father, deliver those that are struggling with bondage, Father, in the flesh. Deliver them, Father. Give us each strength and courage to be a witness and have a testimony for you, Father. We just ask your blessing upon us till we meet again, Lord. We ask it in Jesus' name, church says. Amen. Cowboy church says. Yeehaw. And Joe says. Y'all come back now, you hear?